Um, hello, everyone, and welcome to Great Plains Quinn Friday Focus for Health, hosted by the Great Plains Quality Innovation Network, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services Quality Innovation Network, the Quality Improvement Organization for North Dakota and South Dakota. That's always a mouthful, goodness. But my name is Lori Hintz, and I'm a registered nurse and a quality improvement advisor for the Great Plains Quinn. Along with my colleagues, Stephanie Maduna, Carrie McDermott, and I don't think Kelsey's on, but Kelsey Olson is a big part of the team as well, and Tammy Wagner. Um, we want to thank you all for joining us today. So today's webinar is being recorded and will be posted within one to two business days on our website at greatplainsquin.org under Friday Focus for Health, um, the link. And then we will also share that link with you in the chat. If you have questions, please add them to the chat. We have added a resource handout that you can access that includes all resources shared during today's session and including those resources we discussed in the month's prior session. This session concludes our February series to, re to reduce avoidable emergency department visits. Today, we are going to focus on infections, falls, and medication adverse drug events, and how managing these can help prevent avoidable ED visits and hospitalizations. We will also talk about when you have success to be sure to celebrate. Remember, small incremental changes are important and drive improvement. I always say not everything we do is a home run, but base hits win plenty of ball games too. So we really would like your feedback on these weekly um, sessions and also um, really to get any ideas on future sessions. So we're sharing this QR code to use with your camera on a smartphone or the evaluation link will be placed in chat as well. But we would love for you to open these up to be ready to provide us feedback at the end. We've based our weekly topics in this series to correlate with our newly developed Reducing Avoidable ED Visits and Hospitalization Toolkit. The toolkit is six pages of jam-packed strategies and resources and guide you through a quality improvement process to reduce avoidable ED visits and hospitalizations. The links shown are the toolkit and then our quality improvement process guide. So let's just take a quick recap of this February um, series. So week one, the toolkit, toolkit was introduced and the basic steps of initiating a quality improvement project, including common reasons for potentially avoidable ER visits. We talked about communication gaps between everyone and how unrecognized and unreported early changes in patient conditions are among the main reason for these avoidable transfers. And then we talked about the interact stop and watch to, and the facility capability tools in, in um, week two. Week three, we highlighted the importance of effective team huddles, the team steps communication curriculum and advanced care planning. And now this is week four. And as I mentioned earlier, we're going to touch on infections, falls, and medications with regard to ED visits. Um, and then we're measuring success and celebration. So we're gonna start out with infections. Um, early recognition of infection signs and symptoms, monitoring, treating, and communicating the changes to the caregiving team are key to decrease ED visits. Infections such as those in the urinary tract, respiratory tract, and on skin and wounds that are not recognized early on can turn into sepsis, a medical emergency. Excellent assessment skills, critical thinking skills, and communication skills cannot be stressed enough. Sometimes the change of condition presents overtly and other times only subtle changes and that maybe those changes are only something a family or even you know, a housekeeper might notice. Um, the interact stop and watch cards uh, we talked about in week two have proven helpful, especially with getting input on those subtle changes. 
I want to emphasize the, the taking of vital signs and knowing the baseline and being alert to changes. Listen to those heart and lung sounds. Assess mentation. Is the person eating or drinking? And if not, could they be dehydrated? We all know dehydration can cause UTIs. And maybe just by increasing fluid intake, a UTI could be prevented. If, patient, if the patient is having breathing problems, uh, maybe the person is experiencing some congestive heart failure and early signs of congestive heart failure. And maybe with just a couple doses of Lasix and restricting sodium is all someone needs to do to prevent a full-blown congestive heart failure event. In the toolkit, under section six, there are links to, U to a UTI toolkit, a head to toe infection prevention handbook, and several more. The Interact Decision Support Tools Change in Condition file cards are a great resource to utilize to help recognize early symptoms. Remember to access the Interact tools. You have to register first, but it is free. Sepsis. It's a life-threatening organ dysfunction caused by a dysregulated response to infection, regardless of the primary site of the source of infection. Identifying sepsis can be challenging, despite there are some pretty clear criteria. Temperature above 100, heart rate above 100, blood pressure below 100, respiratory rate greater than 22 per minute, and altered mentation sometimes. If caught early, sepsis can be reversed with fluids and antibiotics, but so often it is not caught early and the person presents as very, very sick with that infection raging in the body. I'd like to show just a short video on one family's struggle with sepsis. He was displaying sepsis symptoms that we didn't know what that was. So that night, he had a fever that went to 104 and a half. Niall died the next morning, 2006, um, April 17th. We were absolutely in shock when this happened. And he was, uh, you know, the love of our life, really. He was part of what we did day in, in and day out. So it's been a big, a big loss for us. He had been in the hospital. He'd been in there for care. He had a fever. He had flu-like symptoms. Niall died because they didn't know how to read the absolutely positive signs of sepsis. We tried to keep his spirit alive. It really inspired us to do something about it, to stand up and try to make a difference for other people so that they wouldn't have to go through a similar type of uh, event that we went through. Okay. So they talked about it, it wasn't recognized. And you know what, I have a story myself. I had a bout with sepsis after a major abdominal surgery. And I will tell you, I diagnosed it myself. I really just wasn't doing well one day post-op. And they were doing frequent blood pressures, vital signs, but I noticed my blood pressure dropping a little bit every time they took it. I noticed my heart rate climbing. And even my respirations were increasing. I noticed my urine output was decreasing as well, despite having an IV and getting fluids. Also, uh, my potassium was very low. And I said to my sis, and I seriously, I just felt like something's not right. So I said to my sister, do you think I'm septic? Could I be septic? 
And she goes, I think you might be. And from there, she was my advocate and got the ball rolling. And I got increased fluids, more antibiotics, some potassium. And I quickly turned around. Um, my vital signs were being taken, but I really don't think anyone was putting it together that I was becoming septic. So sepsis can be pretty sneaky, sneaky <laughs> until it's not. And I'm um, glad to say, you know, I recovered real very well and got the treatment I needed, but I was heading in the wrong direction, that's for sure. So now we're going to go to falls. And let me just say, with the amount of time we have, um, it's, we're just touching the surface on all these subjects. So hopefully in the future, we can dive in a little more deeper on, on some of these subjects. But let's go with falls now. So falls are a very common reason for going to the emergency department in a hospital. It's believed that some of these falls could be avoided. Usually it is the falls that cause broken bones, lacerations, or head injuries that are seen in, in the emergency department. A past history of a fall is a single best predictor of future falls. In fact, 30 to 40% of those who fall will do so again. There are several fall to toolkits out there and that you can access simply by doing a Google search or going to our um, toolkit. We provided the link for the Agency for Healthcare Research, the ARC full, um, Fall Toolkit here on this slide. Um, another link provided is the Post Falls Protocol example. So if you find someone that falls, a rule of thumb is to wait at least five minutes before moving the patient or resident. And during that time, you want to check for injury and administer first aid and resuscitation if, if need be. But let's just use the premise that someone fell, doesn't appear to have an obvious injury, but you still should, should do a good assessment. You should take vital signs, especially a pulse and blood pressure. And then if possible, also check a blood sugar. Even if they are not a known diabetic, if you've got access to take a blood sugar, you should do that. Because low blood sugars oftentimes cause falls. Let's say it was a hypoglycemic reaction. You've got a low blood sugar. Then you want to treat it with some glucagon or some orange juice, a snack, if, if they're conscious and can, can eat or drink. And they typically will likely start to feel better as the blood sugar goes back to normal. Of course, you would notify the doctor, but this quick response alone may just prevent an unnecessary trip to the ER and maybe will only require a clinic visit or maybe just continue to monitor in place. You want to take a good look at the environment where a fall may have happened, the time of day, what the patient was doing when he fell. Basically, be like a Sherlock Holmes and investigate. Include other people in your investigation. They may see something that you're not seeing. Great Plains Quinn has a post-fall huddle template that guides you through a fall investigation process, along with using quality improvement tools. Um, that link is on the slide, but it's also in section seven in our toolkit. Here are a couple more tips. If a person falls when getting up or out of a reclining position or sitting position, it might be a blood pressure problem, and they were experiencing orthostatic hypotension. So you want to take a blood pressure reading when that person is lying down and then take it again when they are standing. If the blood pressure drops greater than 20 points or the person is feeling lightheaded, this is abnormal. It might be a medication. It might be related to a medication. Vision and hearing impairments can be the cause of falls along with weakness and balance, balance issues. If the environment is noisy, such as hospitals and nursing homes with alarms, monitors, and lots of beeping, consider making the environment alarm-free and quiet to avoid startling patients. A normal reaction when anyone hears an alarm sets off a warning that one should leave the area or check on something. 
For persons with dementia, the noisy environment with alarms beeping only magnifies that feeling that they need to get out of the area or check on something. And oftentimes this can be the cause of a fall. Hourly rounding on patients or residents um, with a visual focus on the positioning of the person, personal care such as toileting, um, are they in pain or comfort, you know, want to keep them comfortable, and personal items are within reach is another best practice to prevent falls. You want to anticipate the needs of the person you are caring for and always scanning that environment that it is safe and conducive to someone up and about. So let's touch on medication adverse events. Some of the symptoms seen as a result of a medication adverse event are behavioral changes, falls, gastrointestinal, breathing, heart balance, mobility, eating, sleep pattern changes, to even death can be caused by medication adverse events. And all of these can be reasons for ending up in the emergency department or being hospitalized. Anti-diabetic medications um, such as insulin, anticoagulants, antiplatelets, and opioid pain medications are some high-risk drugs that can be the culprit of serious adverse drug events but there are others as well, such as antipsychotics. Factor in polypharmacy, where people are having five or more medications, human error, the complexities of care, prescribing and dispensing medications, and then yes, communication gaps. Many of these ADEs or adverse drug events that are experienced are considered preventable. Today, I'd like to focus on the communication gaps and show this video. Did you know that you can easily make a difference in patient care and safety? One in nine adult visits to the emergency department are because of an adverse drug event and one in three of those visits for adverse drug events are because the patients were put back on a medication that previously caused harm. Repeat adverse drug events occur partially because information systems don't connect very well across health sectors, and patients' adverse drug event information can't be shared easily between healthcare providers. Take 78-year-old Sarah Story, for example. Sarah visited the emergency department because she had been feeling weakness and dizziness for a few days and was afraid to leave her house. Sarah was found to have hyponatremia, an abnormally low level of sodium in the blood. A pharmacist in the emergency department reviewed Sarah's medications and identified that a recently prescribed medication for treating high blood pressure, hydrochlorothiazide, was likely to have caused Sarah's symptoms. This is a type of adverse drug event. After treatment, Sarah was taken off the drug that had caused the problem and discharged back into the care of her family doctor. Sarah mentioned the episode to her family doctor, but she did not remember the details very well, nor did Sarah's doctor have access to the hospital's medical record. This left Sarah's family doctor and community pharmacist guessing as to which medication caused a problem and uncertain of the nature of her reaction. Since Sarah needed treatment for her high blood pressure, her family doctor followed standard guidelines and re-prescribed the same medication, which her community pharmacist re-dispensed. Sarah was soon back in the emergency department, facing the exact same scenario. Repeat adverse drug events are preventable, but because of gaps in communication, community-based providers, including pharmacists, are at risk of making decisions without a complete picture. Thankfully, researchers from UBC and SFU worked with the British Columbia Ministry of Health and Clinicians to develop Action ADE. Action ADE allows clinicians to rapidly document adverse drug event information in a few key strokes. Because it is integrated with PharmaNet, BC's central medication dispensing database, the two systems can exchange information. Action ADE sends the adverse drug event information to PharmaNet. So anyone with access to PharmaNet who is part of the patient's circle of care will be able to see the documented adverse drug event information. 
community pharmacists will then receive a patient-specific alert if they try to redispense the same medication or medication of the same class as the one which caused harm. Let's make sure patients are not harmed twice. Together, we can prevent adverse drug events and make a difference in patient care and safety. To learn more, please visit Action A. Okay, so this was a project in Canada, but, um, you know, this, oftentimes ADEs are not documented in medical records and are not communicated between care providers and across healthcare systems electronically. Our healthcare system relies heavily on patients and families to communicate adverse drug event information. As a result, information often falls through the cracks and care providers may unintentionally re-expose patients to medications that previously caused clinically significant adverse drug events. While sharing medical information across one health system may be improving, sharing information across different health systems and different providers remain largely dysfunctional, and there is plenty of opportunity for improvement. If 33% of ADEs are repeat events, imagine how the instances of ADEs could be reduced if we as a healthcare team just close this communication gap. So section eight of the toolkit has many more uh, resources. I think we have to, I'm, I wanna read this story about a pharmacist from Canada about an ADE. So I saw a diabetic patient today who was discharged from another local hospital on Friday where he was admitted for hypoglycemia due to glyburide, a medication. The doctor asked him to stop the glyburide and gave him a prescription for glycoside, which has a lower risk of hypoglycemia. The patient presented here again with a critically low blood sugar, was treated, and then became hypoglycemic again. When I looked at the patient's blister pack, I was horrified to discover that both glyburide and glycoside was, was in the blister pack. It turns out that the patient had been given a discharge prescription for glycoside, but there was no note on the discharge prescription to continue the glyburide. So as I read this, I couldn't help but think of a couple of approaches that might have prevented this event. Closer attention on medication medication reconciliation, compare the pre-hospitalization med list with the discharge med list. We need to write better discharge instructions and then possibly use um, the teach back approach, assess for understanding, don't assume the patient knows. So now we're gonna talk about um, reducing ER visits and hospitalizations is a huge topic and the reasons are many. If you've been attending this series, we hope you have a continued interest in reducing unnecessary ER visits and hospitalizations. Last week, a few attendees shared they were starting to track their ED visits to identify who, what, and why for the transfer. And once that is established, you can delve further into the QI process by setting a goal, plan, and carry out action steps. Determine your benchmarks and how and what you will collect and analyze your data to see if you are making progress toward your goal. Measurement is an important com component of a performance improvement project. Um, what gets measured gets done is many a quality improvement person's motto. What gets measured gets done. Both outcome and process measures should be part of the measurement process. For example, an outcome measure may be the number of transfers to the ED per month. But an example of a process measure is would be like um, something like the number of times a staff uses stop and watch communication tool, or the number of times an SBAR is used to communicate a change in condition to the doctor, and the number of times the involved patient was transferred versus being managed in place. So be sure you have an outcome and process measure both in your project. Once you have begun to collect your data, consider placing the data in a run chart 
for your project to help really tell the story and keep your team motivated. In addition to just showing the data, show when specific changes are tested and implemented. Many of you probably already know how to make a run chart, but if not, I place some links for tutorials. And you can also just Google how to make a run chart in Excel and you will find many. It's good to celebrate. Celebrating our successes builds morale, empowers staff, and helps create a strong quality improvement culture. We're often too busy with planning the next stage of the project to stop and recognize the hard work and achievements that have been accomplished. We should not underestimate the motivational impact and value of celebrating success and milestones. With that being said, if celebration, recognition, and appreciation are going to be motivating, then they shouldn't really be saved until the very end of the project, but rather celebrate early and often to reward those involved and maintain momentum. One way to promote and recognize the project is to display a storyboard and put it in a prominent location. Make it visible. Share with your staff and with your patients, with families and even your community. The CMS storyboard, storyboard guide gives ideas to what to include. And I've got the link here on the slide. Consider submitting a story of your project to the local media. Put it on your social media and in newsletters. So we often don't want the outside to know our weaknesses or areas of needed improvement for fear they will think that we aren't doing a good job. But that really is the exact opposite. Your customers will appreciate your quest for quality and your reputation will only be elevated. To our leadership, please send a personal thank you to your QI team members. Express gratitude and value for their efforts. Praise them in front of their peers, leaders, and community. Even if many of the ideas may have originated with you, give them the credit and project ownership. You are then setting them up for success and team members will usually want to take the project even further and they will be more apt to be involved in future quality improvement projects. This picture here shows an example of a storyboard that focused on a PIP project to reduce the incidence of pressure ulcers in their nursing home. The nursing home displayed the storyboard in a common area for all to see. And I really just like the quote that this QAPI coordinator sent me. Developing and displaying storyboards in our center helps to increase staff, resident, and family engagement in our QAPI projects. It gives a little pat on the back every day to our team and validates the importance of practicing strong QAPI strat strategies 365 days a year. And as usual, I talk too much, so we're getting close to the end here. <laughs> But um, I'm not sure how long, we probably don't have time for office hours. So I'm gonna just move on and to tell you very much thank you for um, joining us. Um, is there any questions? I guess we've got time to take a few questions or if anything's in the chat. I haven't seen anything in the chat yet, Lori, but by all means, if you guys have questions, please go ahead and put it in the chat. As you're thinking on this, um, as a reminder, um, our Friday for Focus um, for health topics will be changing for March, beginning March 10th. We will be discussing strategies for opioid misuse from 12 to 12.30, and from 12.30 to 1, we will be discussing um, CDI, Clostridium disophil infections. And you can register for this series by using this link, which you will find in the chat. Any questions yet for in chat? No questions. I apologize for going over and um, if you know me, you know me. <laughs> but thank you so much for attending. Please complete the webinar evaluation so we can continue to our work to make our time together valuable. Attendees will be dropped off at the evaluation at the conclusion of this call. If it is easier for you, you can scan the QR code or click the link within the chat to complete the form. Thank you again for joining us. 
and enjoy your day. Thank you, Lori. Bye-bye.